Hello, my name is Allison Posey. Welcome to this brief overview of Universal Design for Learning. This webinar is going to have two parts. One is going to be the conceptual shift that focuses on the theory, and the second is going to be more practical and what can you do to get started. So we're going to kick off with two analogies. And the first is the dinner party analogy. This um, has been an example that was initially introduced by Katie Novak and is one that has really resonated for helping to think about UDL. So imagine that we're going to invite all of you over for dinner tonight and we're going to serve my favorite lasagna. And it's a Mexican lasagna. So you can see there are layers of noodles covered in cheese. There's ground beef, there are beans and corn inside of the lasagna, and I get super excited about it. I love this lasagna. And the question is, how many of you are not eating this lasagna? And as you start to think about that, we might be able to predict. If I were to guess, I would say, well, some of you might have said, I'm not eating the noodles, gluten-free. Some might have said that cheese is not going to do well for me. Um, others might not have liked the ground beef that was shredded and really was, you know, hard and something that you couldn't separate was all throughout. And so I could have made four lasagnas. I could have made my average lasagna or I could have made um, these four other lasagnas, but there's a different approach because we can anticipate the variability of our eaters. Uh, we can start to design for it. And to best design for it, we actually could prepare more of a buffet where the individuals themselves could go through and select what they want on and in their lasagna and then they stick it in my high heat oven and there they they each have their own lasagna and this can be more engaging it empowers the individual themselves to be able to really think about what do i need what have i already eaten where am i going tomorrow what am i going to need to do and you actually have to be much more of a strategic purposeful expert eater in order to be able to know how to go through a buffet effectively and you also need to know the destination you need to know the goal so let me shift to another analogy here and then we'll hop back to the buffet analogy the second analogy that's critical for thinking about udl is the gps analogy uh, and this um, this was initially written up by uh, David Rose and Jenna Gravel in a great article called Getting From Here to There that really focused on aligning GPS, thinking about the GPS with the UDL um, guidelines. And the first thing you have to do when you go to use your GPS on your phone um, is enter the destination. You have to know where to go. And once you know where you're going, the destination, then you know how to select the options. You might choose the no toll route, or you might choose the scenic route, or you might turn off the audio, or you might shift and have a different voice reading the audio to you. You might have the directions listed, or you might watch them, you know, more of the up close map view. You have a handful of options already designed into your GPS. The makers of the iPhones and um, of our devices, they didn't know each one of us, but they did know, um, you know, we can provide some different options in the design of our environment for people to be able to get to their destination. So if we go back um, to our buffet analogy, when we know the goal, we're able to be much more effective at designing our buffet. So if our goal is to carbo load, we're gonna go through the buffet very differently than if our goal is to eat all four food groups. Like if you have to get a fruit, a veggie, a protein, and a carbohydrate, you'll go through very differently than if you're trying to protein load and, and bulk up your protein count. Um, so the goals are going to drive how we set our, our buffets, which is going to help us design for the variability of our eaters that we know we will have. And I hope now you've started making some connections to education in your educational practices, where we can start thinking about what is this one size fits all curricula that is prepared and that we're giving to our students. And it might be a lesson we love. This is the lesson that we, that I remember doing when I was a kid and I love this lesson. Um, and we can start thinking about who we already know this lesson won't work for. And we can ideally with UDL, we start to design a buffet. It's proactive and it's very intentional because it's goal driven. When we know our learning objectives, when we know the goals, when we know the purpose, then we're able to design much more effectively. So that's the big picture of UDL. 
Now to get into the research base, there were two big fields, there were several fields that inspired UDL. Two of them are architecture and neuroscience. When we think of architecture, this is an old view of access. So here's a school building here in Massachusetts, and let's say the goal, we're always gonna start with the goal, let's say the initial goal is just to get into the building. You can probably already start to anticipate some of the barriers that your wide range of users are going to encounter. From not knowing what the building is, to the narrow opening, to the bump of the, of the curb that's there, to the steps, to the heavy doors, there are quite a few barriers. And there is a small sign up at the top there, up by the door, that says, and I, I, I really don't, I don't like this sign, uh, disabled persons entrance at rear of building. So right from the start, this design is recognizing that it's not designed for all, and that some people from the beginning aren't going to be able to get in. They're starting at a different place. It doesn't have to be that way. Universal design and architecture really challenges architects to design from the beginning for the greatest range of users. And they recognize that what is necessary for some can be good for all. So a curb cut that might be helpful for, for uh, someone um, in a wheelchair to be able to get um, up and down from the sidewalk might benefit others. Closed captions were initially designed um, for folks with differences in hearing um, and the number one users of closed captions on television are actually couples who go to bed at different times and one likes to have uh, the audio on the television screen. Um, and I know I use automatic doors all the time. So these are in the environment. It's not just for some people, but it's, a, it's necessary for some and good for all. And that really inspired CAST to think about not just physical spaces, but learning spaces and to think about some of the scaffolds and tools that might be necessary for some could be good for all. And let's put them in the design of the environment from the very beginning so that more are able to access, the wide variability of our learners are able to access the content from the very beginning. And the way neuroscience impacted UDL, um, kind of similar to what we did with architecture, there was an old view of learning in the brain. And we know this to not be true anymore. We used to have this idea that there were fixed spots in the brain and we could label an individual brain, and I don't even like the word normal, that's on here that was, that was used. What we know now is so much more exciting. So the brain is unbelievably interconnected. Um, this is a picture of our connectome showing all the white matter tracks. And based on our use, these tracks build and grow based on our interactions with the environment. So what we do impacts the development of our neural networks. Let's see if my little simulation will run. The next piece that's really important for understanding UDL um, is to realize that there are no isolated parts in the brain. When the brain is working, even for something really simple, all of the brain lights up, all of the brain is involved. Not one part of the brain has been shown to go unused. So neurologically, there are not isolated learning styles, there are no right or left brain learners. Unless you've had a hemispherectomy, you are using all of your brain. Um, and we are all using our brain in incredibly unique ways based on how, based on our experiences, based on how we've interacted with the environment in the past. And this can start to seem overwhelming. If you start to think about all of the different potential variability of all of your different learners and all of their different backgrounds, how do we design for this? This is where UDL can come in to really help us out as educators. UDL is a tool to help us predict and anticipate our variability so that we can design our learning environments with a buffet, a learning buffet that's very intentionally designed for all of our learners, every single one. And we think about brains in terms of engagement because we know that in the core of our brain, engagement is essential for learning. It activates our physiology. Um, emotions actually underlie all of the UDL guidelines. Um, every experience we have is grounded and rooted in emotion. And we, when we think about engagement and how students are interacting and um, activated in an environment, we have to capture that first. We also wanna think about how information is represented so our learners can perceive and begin to build language and comprehension around it. And also, very importantly, um, we need to think about how individuals can show what they know. 
Uh, we know that they have different, again, backgrounds and experiences and ways that they can um, be strategic and goal-directed and monitor their progress through their learning. And we want to scaffold that along the way so that we are getting to expert learners who are really purposeful and motivated. They know how to be resourceful and find the, uh, the materials they need, and they're able to be very strategic and goal-directed. This is for all learners. Every learner has a brain. Every brain is going to be incredibly variable and unique. So when we design a buffet of a few options that are goal-directed, they're all always in line with the goal, then we're able to better scaffold all of our learners in our environments. So now the good part. So that was the theory of UDL. Um, now the application part. Hopefully you've already started thinking about um, ways that you can transfer what we're talking about in the theory to application in your different learning context, your learning environments. Again, this can be for very little learners. It can be for adult learners and all learners in between the full spectrum. We all learn. Um, in fact, you never stop learning. <laughs> we're constantly um, interacting with the environment and, and learning from those moments. So to apply UDL, no surprise, the first thing you have to do absolutely is identify your destination. What is your goal? What's your purpose? What's your central objective? And we have so many of these. We could get it from content, from skills, from standards, behaviors, social emotional goals, um, PBIS. We have lots of different goals and standards. Um, and if we don't select our goal, it's kind of like going grocery shopping without a list. If you just go into the grocery store, there are tons of options. If you first take a look at the UDL guidelines, it has tons of strategies in there. But when you know a goal, when you know your purpose and intent, you know how to grocery shop much more strategically. If you know that you're shopping for a team breakfast, you're gonna shop very differently than if you're going for an afternoon tea with in-laws. So knowing the goal is going to allow us to select intentional goal-driven options that we put in the design of the environment and let all learners be able to choose which ones will help them as they work and progress in their learning experience. The second thing we want to do is anticipate the variability and value that variability. David Rose, the co-founder of CAST, once said, we want our learners to be more different at the end of the year than at the beginning. We really want to value this variability and help reduce construct irrelevant barriers that don't need to be there. So you can think of your lessons and your learning experiences. Where do students get stuck? Where do you have to reteach? Start there and think about how you might design a little bit of a buffet, an option, um, in terms of how your students engage, how the information is represented for them to build their background, and how they can show what they know. So the UDL guidelines become this tool to help us think about how to design our learning buffet in our different environments whatever the environment may be. It may be after school programs, museums, workforce places, um, K-12, higher ed contexts, um, preschools. When you know your purpose, you can start to anticipate some of the barriers, reduce those so there are flexible options for your learners to get at those goals and objectives. We're keeping the rigor where it should be. We're keeping the challenge where it should be. And we're thinking deeply about the engagement, the meaning, the value of what we're learning, how you can build high-level comprehension of those concepts, and how you can show what you know in a way that best demonstrates your knowledge. So when we look a little bit deeper at the UDL engagement guidelines, we're thinking deeply about how we're recruiting interest, how we're providing individual choice and autonomy, and making things valuable and relevant and authentic, connected to our communities, connected to our schools, things that matter to our learners, and how are we minimizing threats and distractions that are in the environment. We're also thinking about how we can support sustaining effort and persistence. How can we make the goals salient? How can we vary the demands and resources, foster collaboration, and give mastery-oriented feedback? We're also thinking about self-regulation and how we really promote high expectations for all of our learners and how can they self-regulate and build skills uh, and self-assess and reflect on their own learning process. That's deep expert learning. When you think about the UDL representation guidelines, we're thinking about um, how we really, really help students to build their backgrounds so they're becoming res resourceful and knowledgeable. And first, we have to make sure they can perceive it. 
How can they customize the display and have options for auditory and visual information? How can we clarify the vocabulary, symbol, and syntax in there and use multiple media to convey the, the key ideas? And ultimately, we want to get to comprehension, how we're activating background and highlighting patterns and the critical features and guiding that information processing so students can then take what they're learning and apply it to the real world. Uh, they, can, they can maximize their, their transfer, transfer and generalization. Last but definitely not least, super important, is we want to help scaffold um, the action and expression guidelines, where we're thinking about how students can show what they know, express and communicate, and build their executive functions. So maybe it's through varying the methods of them being able to um, respond and use assistive technologies. Maybe it's through scaffolding um, the use of media and tools to get at um, different levels of support. So maybe there are coaches, graphic organizers, challenge problems for them to work out. And we also want to make sure, this can be a, you know, a huge thing to think about, that we're scaffolding um, appropriate goal setting and facilitating um, the planning and the process and your ability, students' ability to monitor their progress through their own learning. This is deep, high-level learning for all of our learners. Never feel like you have to use every UDL guideline and checkpoint. Um, that's like going to the grocery store and buying everything, and that's not effective. Let the goals and your anticipated barriers drive your intentional, proactive design. We hear repeatedly from educators that UDL helps them be very intentional about the design. It's not haphazard anymore, but they know why, and they're able to share with students that why. And that allows them to know how they can then be flexible so that they really are meeting the needs of all of their students. So thank you for, um, for writing with me on this introduction to UDL, where we explored some of the research base and had an overview introduction to the UDL guidelines and how to apply them. So I hope you pause for a moment to reflect on what resonated and what's one action that you want to take next. I'm Allison Posey from CAST. Thank you so much.